I'm really excited about uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Alvin Marcus Fountain II will be talking about Roman Dmowski, who is um, a black hole in historiography. He's actually world's leading expert on Dmowski, not just by default, his book still stands as the best monograph on uh, Dmowski, who was a leader of the National um, Democratic Party. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Fountain, like me, uh, received his PhD at Satan's Nest, Columbia University, uh, from uh, the very same people like Dish van Dijk and Joe Rothschild, who were um, uh, who, who his mentors and actually allowed him to commit academic suicide by writing on uh, Dmowski. And I am pleased to announce that, uh, uh, last but not least, a uh, Dr. Fountain, Dr. Fountain benefited from great tolerance and open-mindedness of Professor, late Professor Fisher Galati of East European Monographs, Columbia University Press. He was the only one to uh, publish without any fear, even the most controversial stuff. Uh, I'm very happy to have Dr. Fountain here as an honorary council of the Republic of Poland for Riley, North Carolina. And he also heads the Paderewski Piano Festival in Riley. So you have a uh, Sadron uh, from Dixieland who is a Polonophile. Here, here, yay. <laughs> I hope that you will forgive me uh, if I make one announcement first, and that is that yesterday at lunch I bit into something and broke completely in two, I think, a tooth on my lower right side of uh, jaw here. So uh, if you find me gripping the uh, podium on occasion to keep from keeling over, it's because the right side of my face is in some rebellion against uh, the rest of my head here. Uh, I've taken the liberty of throwing this map up here at the very beginning because I don't want to take a break uh, to try to lift it up into that position at some later point. So it's uh, preceding its actual place in the presentation. But since I believe that most of you, I think uh, perhaps 100% of you have never seen this map, Although some of you may have heard of it, this is the famous or infamous Jakob Spett map, which uh, Roman Domowski carried about with him at the uh, uh, Versailles Peace Treaty and uh, for several months before that. Uh, it has something of a history, I'll go into it a bit later. It has to do obviously with the western frontier of Poland, which was always the chief uh, area of interest for all of the index in Roman Domowski, Piast Poland is Western Poland and uh, forever will be. So uh, I realize that here with Mienzimosia I am uh, in an area where uh, perhaps the Jagiellonian uh, concept of Polish history or the Piłsudski efforts at federation, uh, Kamil Jewanowski and others uh, on federation uh, have some uh, tenacious hold, but uh, the, uh, I believe that uh, Domowski has a very strong claim to being a very important person in the recreation of the Polish state, certainly equal to that of Piłsudski. So uh, having thrown out the first of uh, many controversial comments, uh, I will await your questions at the end. Uh, it was mentioned that I'm a southerner. I am indeed. I was once accused of being an Englishman. This was in a bar b between 110th and 111th Streets in Broadway, on Broadway, called the Gold Rail. I lived around the corner in the middle of 110th Street, also known as Cathedral Parkway. So uh, I was in that bar on any number of occasions. Uh, it was a defining moment in my life. I hadn't considered that I might be a thought an Englishman. We'd been in North Carolina, not just the United States or the colonial era, but uh, in North Carolina alone for some 300 years. So my uh, 
connection to England I thought was somewhat tenuous, but it was a very instructive moment. Uh, I'm also, as I look around here, I think possibly the oldest person in the room that has become a staple wherever I go. Uh, I'm 72. So that when I was at Columbia, long before Khodakiewicz was at Columbia, in uh, 1967 through 71, uh, Oskar Haletsky was still very much alive. I had the uh, good fortune to hear him at the Kosciuszko House and uh, on the east side on a couple of occasions and felt honored to be in that company. So uh, he mentioned Istvan Dejak, a fabulous Hungarian and always a friend of uh, Poland. And to him it was uh, very influential that I came from a German milieu to study East Central European history. I had studied at Göttingen in the summer and uh, fall and winter semester and summer semester of 1964-65. So I came from a Western viewpoint rather than from a Soviet viewpoint lopping back in some sort of wash out of the East. And this appealed to no end to, uh, to Dayak. My first reader was Wojtek Masny, a Czech, a marvelous fellow. And most of you are going to be familiar with him. He ended up at Johns Hopkins. He's got a place in Italy, you know, all sorts of good things here. Uh, my second reader was Joseph Rothschild. And a, a quick item for those of you familiar with my book. Rothschild, when I sent my dissertation in, uh, looked at my final chapter, and, uh, which was conventional. I said, uh, I have done A, B, C, D, E, and F, which I'd already argued in the prior chapters. He writes back and says, this is dead boring. This is truly some Einschlafen in the German. Uh, it's, to, it's to put me all to sleep. Can't you do something for me to keep me awake after having plowed my way through this dissertation. So I sat down and I wrote out 22 double spaced pages in one night in four hours. And for those of you familiar with my book, that is the last chapter in the book. And that has excited the most controversy of any of them. But at any rate, I appeal to Joe Rothschild. And uh, I take back none of what I wrote in that final chapter either, for that matter. I compared him to Kav uh, Dmowski to Kavur. I said he was chiefly responsible for the return of Poland as a viable state, that is, with the foundations. I'm getting far afield here. I'd better go back to my written words here and read them as fast as I can here. One last story, again uh, showing uh, my age. Uh, as uh, many of you are aware, in the spring of 1968, Columbia had a huge spasm uh, the place was shut down. Uh, spasm is one of my favorite words, by the way. Uh, you may hear it again today. Uh, and uh, one of the guest professors at the invitation of Istvan Dayak at that time was a man by the name of John C. Campbell. Campbell was with the uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, publishers of the uh, periodical Foreign Affairs. Marvelous fellow. He'd been one of the young tykes Tyros, whatever you want to call them, at Versailles in 1919, along with Walter Lippmann and others. So here was a living connection with that particular event. So he came in and told a personal story at one point along the way that they wanted to have a little fun one day with uh, Isaiah Bowman, who headed up the American experts. So they uh, decided that they would discover a new nationality, hitherto undiscovered, resident in the Rodop Mountains in the Balkans, and they prepared a whole batch of bogus maps. They prepared some statistical material. They found a couple of oddball English and French monographs, long forgotten, uh, supposedly, and they brought all of these together, and they had a uh, poor old doctor, professor, future president of Johns Hopkins, Isaiah Bowman, on the run. He thought, my God, we've got another one to deal with here. And finally, they uh, revealed the little joke, and uh, all went well. So uh, all of that aside, I can tell stories. That's the problem with historians in general, and old men in particular. 100 years and two days ago, the United States declared war upon Germany. I stand here today in the shadow of that event. World War I was the great precipitating event of the 20th century. World War II was its aftermath and continuation. 
Uh, J.P. Taylor had a point in his uh, famous title, The Struggle for Mastery in Europe. That's of which World War I is at the center, really. I take the position without the, that without this extreme toll of World War I, no Bolshevik revolution would have taken place. Instead, an evolution of the Russian state would have occurred by fits and starts, to be certain. With no Bolshevik revolution, no Hitler, all speculation, of course. Other calamities might have taken place with their own consequences attendant upon their own random factors. Our subject today covers a period of several months at the most chaotic period of the consequences of World War I. I emphasize the chaos. Chaos makes a difference. For more than a quarter century, Roman Domowski's performance at Versailles has been viewed negatively, certainly in English language accounts, while overall the Polish efforts at Versailles have been viewed with favor, considering that Poland was recreated there with international recognition from the great powers, those at least who counted. Uh, a subordinate narrative has taken hold that Domowski's history and his actions immediately preceding the peace conference and continuing through the actual proceedings of the conference cost Poland territories in favor that otherwise might have been expected to accrue to the newly reconstituted state. The creation of the free city of Gdańsk, the requirement of plebiscites in southern East Prussia and Upper Silesia, the delays in sending the Blue Army East, and the saga of the Curzon Line are all laid in part or in whole at his feet. Each of these charges seems overblown. To me, they are definitely overblown. Uh, but I wrote seams here, so we'll go with that for the moment. The actions of the conference instead appear to me more to be the products of long-held judgments, prejudgments, and general foreign policy considerations, especially on the part of the British. A special position is to be reserved for the question of the Minorities Treaty. Overall, however, Domowski's positions appear to be more in line with overall Polish aspirations, overall Polish aspirations, all parties, if indeed they were more Piast than Jagiellonian. Poland received from the Versailles Treaty more or less all it could have reasonably expected to receive. Among the Polish delegation of experts, which was almost as large as similar delegations of the Allies, were quite a number of historians. They continue, or constitute rather, a pleiad of prominent historians of the time. Overall, they range from, uh, at the uh, end closest to the index, Władysław Konopczyński, and near him also Wacław Sobieski. Uh, if you're not familiar with Polish historiography, the, these are fellows who are generally accounted to be on the conservative wing, the Piast wing, the Indek wing, and some of them were members of the Liga Narodowa even for that matter. Uh, I mentioned Konopczyński, Wacław Sobieski, Adam Szalongowski, who were uh, all quite close to the index. Then we move through uh, men like Oswald Balzer, who is sometimes uh, mentioned in uh, those circles, Franciszek Bujak, uh, a marvelous character. Uh, by the way, most people are not aware that Domowski served as a, a uh, groomsman, if you will, at Bujak's wedding. And Bujak married a Jewish woman by the name of Kramstikovna famous Kramstik family, a uh, very assimilationist uh, Jewish family, uh, and I always cite this whenever I'm, I, I get all this anti-Semitism to Mosky trotted out. There's a very special character to all of this. It had more the character of a nationality conflict than, uh, than any other. And then moving on from uh, Balzer and Buyak, we've got Stanislav Kubcheba, from whom I will derive a quote here in just a moment. Uh, quite independent, uh, not beholden to any particular party, and to Oskar Halecki, who because of his strong Roman Catholic approach and his overall <laughs> closeness to a Jagiellonian Polish uh, concept, we could be expected to be no particular friend of the index. And this Catholic uh, opposition uh, to the index is sometimes forgotten. The index were at their beginnings, Balitsky and others, considered to be amoral, anti-Catholic, and much of their rhetoric was uh, at the very beginning opposed to the Catholic Church. They wanted a, a hard-nosed, uh, cold-blooded, if you will, objective uh, approach to uh, politics and history. 
But I uh, mentioned here that I believe they differ, these historians, at Versailles, and indeed most politicians and, and history, historians in Poland itself, only in degree from Domowski's uh, major positions. And uh, again, a controversial comment, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, the quote from uh, Stanisław Kucheba. Poland was allotted a place at the Congress. She had the right to two plenipotentiaries. Roman Domowski, of course, was named one of these delegates, the primary. It would have been difficult to conceive of its being otherwise. This is, to, to me, an extraordinarily straightforward, objective statement from someone who was not personally beholden or politically beholden to uh, Roman Domowski. And this was written in his book, Congress Tractati Polska, uh, uh, 1919. So literally, it's, it's as the uh, conference is winding down. On June the 28th, 1919, exactly five years after the assassination of Francis Ferdinand in Sarajevo, the representatives of the newly reformed states of, of state of Poland were called to sign the document which put the seal of Allied recognition on the existence of that new state. When the name of Poland was called in the alphabetical order allotted to it by Georges Clemenceau's French, two men stepped forward. One was the famed Ignacy Jan Paderewski, whose piano is at my house, uh, uh, Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, who had assumed formal leadership of the Polish delegation upon his arrival in April the, on April the 6th. <laughs> The other who stepped forward was Roman Domowski, who had headed the Polish delegation prior to Paderewski's arrival. The two did not always view the problems facing Poland in the same light. Keep that in mind. Paderewski is his own man, Domowski is his own man. And they, they were not particularly close. Uh, again, this is not the time for uh, an extended discussion of that side of it, but uh, they, were, they cooperated in the United States most certainly in uh, organizing a uh, propaganda effort, a la Pani Cannon, to uh, make sure that Poland should be recreated. But it doesn't mean that they were uh, on the same wavelength. He was from Kuriwówka, by the way, Paderewski, which is so far out in Ukraine that you can practically get into Kiev faster than you can get to Warsaw uh, from that particular point. So uh, the scene that Saturday, that is the 28th of June, 1919, has been laid out for us by Adam Grzymała Szedlecki, a theater director and literary critic. And for those of you familiar with this, someone relatively close to the index. So this is a very favorable picture he paints. They had to cross fully half the length of the long hall, Versailles, Hall of Mirrors, to reach the days in the open treaty books. There was plenty of time to take a good look at them. Paderewski's face was composed, moved as if by a prayer made incarnate by the sanctity of this moment and its importance for Poland. Behind this prayer, Domowski strode. He appeared taller even than usual. He was nearly six feet tall, by the way. Most people have no idea. They think of him as being a smaller man, but he was 5'11 uh, at the very least. Um, Taller even than usual, perhaps because he stood bolt upright. He strode with a sure, definite step, his muscular body swaying slightly from side to side, the gravity of the moment traced in his features, and only at the corners of his mouth, by the hint of a smile, and only by his eyes, and in his eyes, what exultation. All the high-flown vigor of the Polish spirit flashed forth from his eyes, like two beacons each to itself, but in that moment united as a whole, these two heads moved through the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles to sign Poland for the first time in decades immemorial into the political history of the world. So, as I said, it's a bit high-flown, uh, perhaps reflective of the times. Uh, again, at my age, I rather like the 19th century style. Uh, my dissertation was uh, panned by some people for that style. But I will say this, that Alexander Ehrlich, who is a marvelous character, I don't know how many of you are familiar with him, is a professor of economics at Columbia, uh, who had studied at the University of Warsaw in the 1930s, and because of his ethnic background, had been in the segregated benches, so to speak, and all. But uh, a marvelous, marvelous character uh, who um, 
always uh, liked me for some reason. I don't know why. I was not a particularly great economics major. But he said, uh, and something I will never forget, he says, I love your writing style. It's positively middle European. <laughs> In other words, it's convoluted and twisted and all sorts of uh, digressions within a single sentence. For those of you familiar with Popuk Malinowski's uh, Najnowski Historia Polityczna Polski, you are familiar with uh, these. Uh, he had one sentence that ran for three or four pages. I mean, just an uh, extraordinary production. Not all the words. Yeah, yeah, it never, never ran out of words. Well, some of us uh, with an English background can do something of the same. My father was a professor of English, so blame him for whatever you hear up here. All right. So, uh, Bogdan Vasutinsky, Indec, later noted that at the moment Domovsky and Paderewski were signing their names, cannon began to fire and a squadron of airplanes flew by. Clemenceau was moved to note this as a good omen for Poland. Certainly an impressive moment, but it would not be <clears throat> the only possible date to begin a presentation. Stanislav Kozicki put forward yet two other dates. Kozicki again is, is close to Domowski. The two most beautiful days in his life that might be pressed into service as starting points for a review of Domowski's activity at Versailles. The first of these was January the 18th, 1919, the day of the opening session of the Peace Conference. Kozicki speaks of the great emotion which gripped Domowski on the way from 11, 11 Avenue Kleber, the seat of the Polish National Committee, to the French Foreign Ministry. The second date was the day of the draft treaty, or day the draft treaty was handed to the German delegation, that is May the 7th, 1919, at the Hotel Trianon, uh, I've been in that room. It's a, a marvelous place. You can feel ghosts all over there. Uh, and this draft treaty contained most of the provisions for which Domowski had fought. Present in various capacities on this latter occasion were Marian Seda and, and this same Stanislav Kozicki, in addition to Domowski and Paderewski. At the end of his article, Kozicki mentioned the signing of the treaty on June 28th that's his third date for a possible beginning, but cast it in the light of Domowski's having a sense therein of a proper recognition of what had actually occurred uh, beforehand. Uh, but the present author agrees with the choice of June 28th, considering that it puts the seal on everything. It marks the highest point in Domowski's achievements in the regaining of the Polish state. Uh, to begin with a vignette from the close of a series of events and then to move to the actions leading up to that closing is an approach hallowed by countless film scripts and popular histories. No apologies. I've gotten so old I don't apologize anymore. I just throw it out there and take whatever comes. He who takes it upon himself to speak of Domowski enters a minefield of opinion. Detonations right and left beset him a mark, perhaps, of a correct approach and presentation. If you're attacked from both sides, obviously you must be uh, correct overall. Uh, this condition goes far to explain why, in the English at least, uh, very little has been written. And uh, it was mentioned that my uh, biography is still the seminal work on this. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. I tend to agree with that because I tend to agree disagree with many of the subsequent uh, shorter biographies or excerpts that have been written on it. So my, my dissertation, by the way, which is that book, is on the fun, uh, fundamental principles of uh, Dmowski. The title is Party Tactics Ideology, 1895-197. These are the years just before he entered the Duma. It's when he's still quite young. He's uh, 45. Uh, at the close, 46 or so, no, and not even that. He was born in 1864, so he's 42 uh, at the close of this particular era. So uh, certainly for that era, and certainly I think for the uh, fundamental precepts, uh, it, it has a great deal yet to offer. Slightly more than 30 years ago, Adam Michnik put forth a relatively favorable portrait of Roman Domowski in his work, Letters from Prison and Other Essays, a source you might not expect. Uh, Michnik even noted his belief that the National Democrats never, even in the 1930s, became fully totalitarian. I agree with him. 
For this essay and these thoughts, uh, he, Michnik, was criticized by friends and fellow prisoners. One can sympathize with him. The subject of Dmowski sets off particularly powerful emotions, not only in Poland, but in the United States and a number of other nations. The most considered and historically grounded of these presentations in English is that by Andrzej Wawicki from the year 2000, which he entitled The Troubling Legacy of Roman Dmowski, and in which he, this is uh, Wawicki, writes, clearly Dmowski's ideological le legacy is multifaceted. His ideas serve many different, sometimes contradictory, and mutually incompatible purposes. In Poland, especially since 1989, on the other hand, a vast amount of paper and ink have been expended, the result of the opening of public dialogue across the board. The Moski has been the object of greatly enhanced interest in the academic world there, and less happily in both the political realm and in the streets. Skinheads have made off with more of his legacy than they deserve to possess. Extreme opponents have argued that he should not be remembered as anything but an embarrassment to the nation. The major traffic circle of Marshal Koska and Jerozolimskia bears his name, and at the junction of Shucha and Yazdowskia stands a statue depicting him with a copy of the Treaty of Versailles in his left hand and in his right hand his hat doffed. Evidently in honor of that selfsame treaty in five minutes, oh my. <laughs> No way. <laughs> we, we, we make it seven. Okay, already. Let's see what we can chop out in large measure here. Uh, you to come back. Half and come back for some other time. That's all right. Uh, I might add that this uh, this statue of Domowski is barely a stone's throw from the much larger statue of Piłsudski at the corner of the Belvedere. There the Belvedere Palace. So you can visit them uh, in a matter of a few minutes, both of them, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's see. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, all right, here we go. The sudden absence of three great powers had left the European world off balance. This is the chaos here. The new and untested balances and checks had not yet become clear. This is the chaos to which I referred. Meanwhile, everything was on the table. Given the peculiarities and vicissitudes of the moment, all could be negotiated, but not all could be changed or altered. The men in Paris representing France, the United Kingdom, and the United States might take pride in their abilities and assume stances that exuded the uh, gloss of a new approach here, a fond hope there, and hard-nosed reality and interest. But the ghosts of the recent enemy Germany and the recent friend Russia were ever present. Although the Germans were not consulted, at least in the open, the partisans of the Tsarist Russian state were still consulted and heard. The known former ally and partner in arms held a place in the backs of the minds of the arbiters of Versailles. Poland and its representatives did not operate in a vacuum. The imperialists fairly reeked of the smoke and gas emanating from the lands and the memories of 1772 Poland, defying the west wind drift. Okay, we're going to move along here. That's page six, and I've got 16, so you <laughs> All right, it's a historian's disease. We tend to dilate a good deal. All right. Uh, uh, we'll go on the, the famous uh, appearance on the 29th of January, etc., etc., etc. Some of you are familiar with that. Um, etc., that's still part of that good stuff. Uh, Pilsudski comes off worse in some of these pages. Let's see, we're looking at uh, David Lloyd George. Dmowski noted in his memoirs that at the end of the break for lunch that day, he and Erasm Pils were speaking with Balfour when Lloyd George, who had been absent at the morning session, this is January 29, 1919, this huge long presentation in French and English, alternating, because Dmowski did his own translations for this. Uh, uh, Lloyd George approached. He hadn't been there in the morning, okay, which is something of a sign in and of itself. Balfour stopped Lloyd George with the intention of introducing him to the Poles and began to speak of Domowski's presentation. According to Domowski, Lloyd George turned on his heel and walked away. This could not fail to be seen as a most unfavorable portent of future actions undertaken as a result of long-held principles on the part of Lloyd George and on the general approach of British diplomacy across the board. 
Lloyd George and the British delegation arrived at Versailles with two strongly entrenched viewpoints. <clears throat> Opposition to a permanent weakening of Germany, and this it cannot be overemphasized, I believe, uh, because a permanent weakening of Germany would lead to an imbalance of power on the continent. The, the British are always uh, at pains to support the second most powerful entity on the continent. As Germany had become all-powerful in the late 19th century, the British moved over to support the French. Here all of a sudden, uh, was, uh, after August the 8th, the Black Day of the German Army in 1918, France is ascendant and Germany is in eclipse. So we have a shifting of position and the British are going to shift along with it. Tack, 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 you know, with it, to use a sailing metaphor here. Um, in general though, Lloyd George was harder on Józef Piłsudski than he was on Domowski. Remember, Piłsudski was a supporter of the Austro uh, solution to Poland's uh, problems in the late 19th and early 20th century. Domowski always considered that a non a starter because the Austrians were obviously an appendage of the Germans so any Austrian solution was uh, by extension a German solution and uh, therefore unacceptable. So uh, running uh, through all of these things here I'm trying to get it down to uh, no more than seven minutes here. Okay. Um, We've got a couple of other things as well. Underlying, uh, this I want to emphasize, and there's one reason I mentioned that I'm a wasp, quote unquote, so that you will see my criticism of the English here is not coming from some arch-Catholic viewpoint, but instead from uh, within my own overall camp. Uh, and that is um, underlying Lloyd George's overall position. In supplementing the traditional turn of British diplomacy to the second most powerful state on the continent, were several other important factors. One would be the friendships of the British delegation with individuals in Germany, especially that of John Maynard Keynes with Karl Melchior, a staple in historiography. A second would be the rather generalized doubt that Poland as a sovereign state would be financially and economically stable as a contributor to Europe, given the generations of German writing on Polnische Wirtschaft, this famous phrase that so many of us have heard, and that was a matter of some generations at this point, not just from Rousseau and, and others in the 18th century at the time of the loss of statehood for Poland, but also from the publication in 1855 of a book in German by Gustav Freitag entitled Zoll und Haben. Are any of you familiar with that? Or, uh, Gustav Freitag, you know, sort of a German popular novelist of the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. Marvelous character. These are extraordinarily funny books, by the way. They're, they're humor. We, we think of the Germans as having no humor on occasion. These are full of it. This case, though. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, which perhaps. <laughs> 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 no, well, well uh, uh, actually, he many, had many connections with Breslau, which became Rotslau. <laughs> so Zollenhaben actually takes place three. I got Max who. Okay. Uh, Okay, we, we, we won't go that far. Zollenhaben, which means debit and credit, but by and large, the, the Poles can't keep books, is the basic point of all of this. And they all go to bed late, and they get up late, and they you know, never get it together. And this has an effect over years. You're talking about soft propaganda or soft diplomacy here. Uh, that, that can have an effect uh, over uh, a period of time. Ancillary to these questions of Polish competency lie also perhaps some question of lingering British doubts as to the world of Roman Catholicism in general. In the discussion of uh, the Peace Conference in 1944, and therefore a quarter century after the events in question, F.S. Marston left Robert Howard Lord completely out of his index by name, so that the two mentions of Lord can be found only through the index entry of the for Polish Affairs Committee. While the first reference on page 107 is bland enough, the second is less complimentary. The Americans had, of course, plenty of experts for the manning of the committees. This, this famous, the George Washington fairly groaned under the weight of their erudition. All of you are probably familiar with that particular quote from Harold Nicholson. But in this particular case, uh, uh, plenty of experts for the manning of the committees. But these lacked actual practical experience and were inclined to take unbalanced views of the situation. This was especially true of Dr. Lord, 
who having gone out with the Warsaw Mission at the beginning of February, returned to Paris in March to act as a member of the Polish Liaison Committee. His attitude, which greatly influenced President Wilson, could hardly be unaffected by the fact of his recent conversion to Catholicism and his conception of the Poles as the sacred crusaders for that faith. So uh, I throw that out there for you. I, I've got other things I can add here. The, the, uh, uh, the bloodbath of Torn in seven, the early 18th century, the uh, Spanish Armada, the black legend of Spain, the 1688 glorious revolution, the items in Queen Anne's oath, which is still sworn that uh, you uh, will defend against any papish plots and all of that sort of thing. There's an underlying anti-Catholicism in the English mentality that somehow Catholicism is the religion of those who are more backward. Uh, this has uh, since been cast aside to some degree. Margaret Macmillan, uh, when she speaks of uh, these various items, doesn't mention Robert Howard Lord at all. Uh, he died, by the way, as the abbot of a monastery in uh, Massachusetts. Marvelous character. Okay, I have been told that I need to roll it and roll with it and roll out of it. Okay, in short, even in the light least favorable to Domowski, that is, and I skipped over all of this, the light least favorable to Domowski, that is the treatment of Jews in Poland and his own obsession with them, it cannot be conclusively shown that the final results at Versailles were materially affected to the detriment of Poland. Certainly not those brought on by him. The British wanted to keep Germany in a position of power economically and militarily, ergo the western frontier, the free the city of Gdańsk, and the plebiscites. Number two, the British and French wanted to keep Russia as an, a, a potential ally, as their preference, large, always in reserve, on the utmost periphery. It was far away. You know, they, it's not that they love Russians. It's just that they're big, and they're out there, and they're not close by. So if we call on them, they won't you know, be a problem to us immediately here. So uh, you can see this at the end of World War II as well, when the Russians get uh, the call, when it's a choice between Poland and Russia. Okay. Um, even the Americans, despite nation-state prejudices, were quite prepared to concede domination of Russia over the lands between, or this Svishen Europa in the German form, perhaps to, up to, and even including Villeneuve and Lvov, both east of the Curzon line. I mean, it's just, I mean, who's to govern this? Who's to say the Russians are better to govern it than the Poles are? Uh, and again, I've, I've got all these reams of words that back some of this up, by the way. Uh, Poland was considered unstable by all, uh, and the Americans were just as doubtful as their British and French counterparts. No one among the Poles wanted the minorities treaty, but they all knew that it would make no difference in practical day-to-day -day governing. And this was the genius of the Poles, especially Paderewski. Uh, Domowski always wanted to make a point of all of this. And I have a discussion in here of the meeting of uh, Marshall and Domowski at the Plaza Hotel and all of these good things. Uh, two, two men who were exactly alike, by the way. And a meeting of two men like that is, is very unlikely to produce uh, compromise. They were un both uncompromising figures. So no one among the Poles wanted the minorities treaty, but they all knew that it would make no difference in practical day-to-day -day governance. And that has been recognized, as I said, also by uh, Margaret Macmillan in her book on Versailles. Of all the basic points of territory and on the need to integrate Jews into society, the members of the Polish delegation were in general agreement. In short, Domowski's absence would not have made a significant change in the overall general approach of the Polish delegation. So uh, by all sorts of different arguments, if he's there, what did he or do or not do? If he had been absent, what would or would not have happened? There isn't much out there to, to argue for a major change. 80% of what they were after is not a bad percentage. I call it the 80% solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm.